Macy said something I think is very important for us, that we can't do this alone. And as she acknowledged that in her testimony, to be able to think about all that's going on around us and know that in our lives as followers of Christ, we can't do this alone. And that's so important for us today. This has been a crazy week. There have been things that have happened this week that uh, have absolutely shocked us, surprised us, uh, sickened us, uh, hurt us. And as a nation, man, we, we have seen so much conversation, right? I mean, we have seen what's going on with Facebook or Twitter or all the things that are happening. It, it has just been an incredible kind of week. So it's, it's historic. We have never lived through a 2020 like we had and get into 2021 with great hopes. And I already saw a meme that was looking forward to 2022 after eight days. And I think we understand that. I think, I think we get that. I think we try to figure out what life is like around us as we've seen this week unfold. The brokenness, the division, the struggles. And I, I have to just be super honest. I've really struggled with what to preach today and how to do that. And in light of what the nation is experiencing and what we're experiencing and what Believers are experiencing and the, and the conflict and division um, and, and the word that I guess I keep hearing from from so many people, whether they're responding on Twitter, Facebook, whatever they're responding on individually with people is is just, man, we we need to be healed. There's got to be a, a healing that takes place somewhere in our lives. There's got to be a, a healing that takes place uh, among people. It's so it's so. I use the word discouraging for all of us to see uh, what's going on politically, right? And the division, uh, yet a part of that you expect because there's, there are those people who don't follow Christ. And so the expectation that I have of them is very different than expectations I have of followers of Christ. But yet it's discouraging when we see followers of Christ who are making comments, who are saying things that I would say are just completely ungodly, and then saying things to each other. Man, you, you, you know, you read a Twitter feed or you read a Facebook feed and you see people responding to people, and, and I just gotta tell you, it, just, it really breaks my heart to see that, to think, here, here are God's people. How, do, how in the world are we responding to the world that's, that's around us? How are we supposed to respond, right? Jesus tells us in Matthew, if you read the Gospel of Matthew, he talks about this whole time where, where we're anxious and worried. And he gives us some formulas of not to be anxious. Why are you, why are you anxious and worried? Yet, yet we see that, not just outside the church, but I think my greater concern is, is we see that inside the church, what the church is dealing with, what the, what the people of God are dealing with, right? And so inside that, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom and all these things. And it just, uh, I come to that place of saying, how, how am I really seeking the kingdom of God and all the things that are going on around us? How am I seeking uh, not to be a nationalist, not to be a, a, an American, or not to be someone who's just focused on our nation, but how do I see the kingdom of God and what God's kingdom wants to do and what God wants to do in our nation and through the church, I'm reminded that Scripture teaches us that judgment is going to happen. And we all agree with that. We all agree with judgment's going to happen and what judgment is and where judgment's going to come from. Most of the time, if you're like me, you think judgment's going to happen to the other person because we're right. So judgment's going to come upon them. Yet we have to remember as a church that the Bible teaches that judgment starts first among God's people. And that's a scary thought. It's a scary thought for the church here in this time period that, that we are going to be judged of how we stand up and, and what we do and how we identify with who Christ is in the culture in which we live. Now, I know most of us uh, 
maybe you're not struggling with it. Maybe, I, I think most of the people are. Everybody I'm reading and hearing and talking to, there's a great deal of struggle among us on how we're, these next dozen days are going to be super tense. There's going to be a lot of things that's going to be said and happen, and who knows what the outcome is going to be. Who knows how that's all going to going to play out. We never would have expected, or at least I would not have expected, uh, what happened this week to have happened in the storming of the Capitol. It's just, a, just an amazing kind of thing. But where does the church, where do we land inside of that? How do we respond as God's people, right? How do we, how do we get through that? I, I'm gonna, I, I know I'm supposed to be fit, speaking from Philippians, and we may get there, but I just want to remind you of, of the scripture in the Old Testament. Uh, one that we have quoted how many times, right, from Chronicles. How many times that we've talked about what, what this passage teaches us in, seven, in chapter 7 of Second Chronicles. And, and you, you'll know the passage. You, when I read it, you'll understand it completely because you've heard it a million times. Uh, unfortunately, this passage that, that I'm going to read is most often somehow connected to America, right? Well, it's, not a, it's not a nationalist passage. I want you to know that. It, it's not about America. America's not mentioned in the Bible, and we're not God's chosen nation. Israel was, this passage in Second Chronicles, was God's chosen nation of Israel. We are God's people, the church. And so what happens in the church is the focus of what happens around us. How is the church going to respond to what's going on around us today? Finding our identity as a body of believers in Philippians, the first chapter, when Paul is speaking to the people of Philippi, he calls them saints. That's the, that's the word he uses for the church. And most of the time, we think of saints as people who are good people, right? Who've done something really well, and so they're a saint. They're a good person. You know, my grandmother was a saint. My mom was a saint. My, somebody, we used to use it in that term. Right? That's what, and then in that passage in First Philippians, or Philippians chapter 1, in the very first verses, he's calling the church the saints, which means we are the chosen ones. We are the set apart ones. That's what that word means. It has to do with the fact that you, as a part of the church of God, the church of the kingdom of God, have been set apart by God to live a certain way, to do a certain thing, to act and live out who Christ is by seeking first God's kingdom. How does a church do that? How do we function inside of saying our identity really is in Christ and we have found our identity? How do we live out that identity in what we see as a struggling nation at a really interesting time in the history? Now, looking back historically through, through our nation, uh, we've, we've had a lot of challenges. Uh, I, I remember my first remembrance of anything government, I think that I really have a clear memory of is the assassination of John Kennedy. I, I remember that. I remember where I was in school. I remember when they came over the loudspeaker and told us. So as a, as a nation, we've had a lot of struggles, and there have been those times. You think about the, the 60s with the, with the protests, the Vietnam War protests, and all the things that were going on, and then the civil rights. So there's been a lot of things, and we have, we have worked hard to overcome so much. But the church inside that, where are we? How, do we? how do we live that out? Well, in this Chronicles passage, the writer from the Lord in the dedication of the temple of Israel says to Solomon, my people who are called by my name, when they humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Now, as I already said, I believe that description is for Israel. It is not for a nation. It is not for the nation of Germany or the nation of Chile or Brazil or America. It is the people of God that he's speaking to. So I think he's calling us as a people of God to really respond, right? There's got to be a response from us. He tells us in this passage pretty clearly how we have to respond. The first thing he says is, my people, my chosen people, as Paul calls us in Philippians, the saints, those who are set apart, the church, if we're going to do what? Humble ourselves. Humility 
Humility means that we put other people before us, that we think differently about other people. Pride, as the Bible teaches us, destroys us. It destroys individuals, it destroys marriages, it destroys families, and we have seen that in our culture. We have seen that destruction that is coming out of pride, but it also destroys the church. And as a church, at some point, we've got to be the kind of people who are focused on what God is doing in our life. And and our humility comes from our confession of our sin. The Bible teaches us that we are people of confessing our sin before God. And we have to be about that. There are so many areas that he deals with in this understanding that when he says, my people who are called by my name, the saints that... Paul says are in Philippi, the same people who are called by my name have to get to that place where we are humbly confessing the things around us. How do we do that individually? I don't know what you've said. I don't know who you've spoken to. I don't know the response that you've given to people. You do. But if the Lord is going to be the kind of God who judges us first as a church, then that means he's going to judge me. He's going to judge me for what I say, and I've got to move away from being a person of pride who think I have all the answers to a person of humility who says that I've got to be going to the next step, and that's what humility drives us to. He says that this person who is humble, this people, my people who are humble, are going to pray. Now, he tells us in this passage, they, they go together, they, they're gonna, they, we're going to be the kind of people who are humble, the kind of people who are praying, and the kind of people who are seeking after God. And that word seeking in that passage in 2 Chronicles is not just we're, just we're just looking for God. You know, we're just waiting for God to show up, we're looking for God to do things. The word that he uses in that passage is the word that as if you are down on your knees looking for the most important thing at your house, right? Maybe there's times in your house where you've lost something and you're looking under the bed or you're looking under the dresser or, and you're trying to find it. You are, you are intently looking at it. You're seeking it because it's of great value. And that's what this word is. That's what he's saying to us, that as a people of God, we are humbling ourselves. We, we are getting to that place where you're confessing our sin in that humility, and that's going to drive us to deep prayer. I've got to tell you, I've been convicted this week personally over these last few days of how little I have prayed for our nation, how little I have been seeking God for the renewal and repentance of God's people. Because most of the time, I can spend time reading Facebook, reading Twitter, looking at Instagram, seeing all the things that are going on around me, watching the news, looking at the news, being able to pull it up on the internet or watch it on TV. And most of my time is giving over to those things. Yet here, here and in Philippians, Paul is telling God's people, as God is telling Solomon, we must be a people of prayer. How often are you praying? How much are you praying? Do you pray as much as you, as you read the newspaper? Do you, do you pray as much as you watch the news? Do you, do you look at the things that are happening on there? And are you praying for God to move inside that? Well, and then he says, of course, we turn from our evil. The word that he uses, word translation might be even evil. It might be used wicked but it's the idea that we're going to change our mind about it. We're going to change who we are. So you see, I've struggled this week. I've struggled trying to figure out how as a believer, not a person on a church staff, but as a believer, just a follower of Christ that lives in a country that I love so much and a country that I believe is the greatest country on the face of the earth. I believe that with my whole heart. Yet I've watched this week and I think, how do I respond? What do I do? And that's why I read that verse to you today. Because every time I tried to get to, oh, I'm preaching from Philippians chapter one. Every time I tried to get to that, it brought me back to, am I the kind of follower that's humble, 
that's bringing myself low, that's being a person who is really in prayer about what's going on around us? Am I really seeking God in this? I'm not saying to you that if we do all those things, all of a sudden things are going to change. Because we're in a culture, we're in a society, we're, we're in a place that, that we don't really know what's going to happen or how God is going to work in that. But I do know. I do know that if I can focus on those things, what it would allow me to do, what it would, what it would change in my heart. Because I can't change another person's heart or I can't think or change how a person thinks or their ideology or their philosophy. I can't change those things. But I can change my heart, and I can change how I feel about people and how I'm praying and what I'm doing and all those things that relate to how I respond to God. Because that's the key here. It's the, how the, the church, how I'm responding to God, how are you responding to God in the nation in which we live so that we are pointing people to Christ, so that we're, we're finding our identity in Christ and we're pointing people to him. Well, I share all that really as an introduction to Philippians because I'm deeply concerned that as a people of God, we are missing the opportunity. And I, and I, I think, I believe it's going to get more difficult in the days to come, but it brings us to a place, you and me, as followers of Christ, where we must be more in tune with what God is doing in our lives and in the church even in conflict, even in distress, even in struggles, so that we might show forth the glory of Christ. Now, if you have your Bible with you, turn to Philippians chapter 1. Because I really believe that's what Paul even begins with as he deals with this passage. As he helps us to understand who we are in finding our identity, I think he gets us to this place where he is helping the church the church at Philippi that he had helped to establish, the church that came out of the fact that he was in prison uh, at that place, in jail at that place with a Philippian jailer when he began to sing praises of all that God was doing and and then everything that came out of the church after that. But in the middle of that, he helps us as a church understand who we are in these first 11 verses, the introduction to this book that we're going to be in for the next few weeks an introduction to how we are going to respond to all the things that are happening around us. He tells us in the first verse that it's about Paul and Timothy who are writing this, and we're understanding that our identity is because of Christ who gives us grace and peace. And I I just want to land there for a little bit because here in these first couple of verses, he tells us that Paul and Timothy, that they are servants of Jesus Christ. They are actually, the word is bond servant. It's a slave kind of servant. It's how we are going to respond to Christ as believers. And a slave kind of servant is one who is going to be committed wholeheartedly. See, there are those people who are hired hands in All around us, we know we hire somebody to do something, right? But these servants of Jesus Christ that he tells us in this first verse, these servants that he's talking about, that he proclaims that he is, are the kind of people who are committed. They are totally committed to what the master says. And so we ask that question, and and our lives and and our culture and the world we're in, are you committed to what Jesus is telling us? How do we know what Jesus is telling us if we're not in his word? How do we know what he's telling us if we're not thinking, I'm seeking first the kingdom of God, God's kingdom, what God wants to do in our midst. Maybe different than what I think it is, but I'm the kind of servant that when I see what God is doing, I'm going to respond to God because I am his slave. I'm going to do what Jesus has told me to do, and I'm going to seek first his kingdom. I'm going to pray. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to be in a place where I'm turning away from my sin. Because that's what he's called me to do. Who has he called that to? First verse, as I've mentioned already, he calls that to the saints, right? He says, we are the the saints in Jesus Christ. That is who we are. We are those who have been set aside. That is the church. That is us, whether you like it or not. Now, if you don't like it, then you have to back up for a little bit and say, where is my salvation? 
am I really a follower of Christ, right? Because if we're a follower of Christ, we, we then would be more in tune to being the saint of God, the one being called out. And we're learning and discovering from God's word what it means to be called out, what it means to follow him. That's what he wants from us. That's how he is driving us. That's what he is leading us to do. We are people who are called out in order to uplift the name of Christ. In the second verse of Philippians chapter 1, he tells us in the second verse that then we have grace and peace, right? That grace to you and peace from God. Grace to you. The word grace means that what you have is unmerited. You did nothing to receive what you have. Now, we struggle with that in the Western culture. We struggled with that in the U.S. because we have been told that we have rights and we have, we have freedoms and all those things that, are, that, that we have as Americans. Yet Jesus says that the kingdom that we're a part of, our rights is to be obedient. Our rights is to be a slave. Our rights is to do exactly what Jesus told us, and that's the right that we have. And the fact that we have salvation comes about because it's a grace from God. It's a gift from God. This word grace has at its very understanding and the root of the word gift. It is a gift to us. It's all it is. And he says, not only the grace that we have, but the peace that comes along with that, the peace that comes into our life. In chapter 4 of Philippians, Paul takes that a little further, and he says, do not worry. I'm in chapter 4, verse 6. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, in prayer Petition with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. That whole worry thing come in. And then he says, and the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and your minds. You know what he means by that? That the peace that he talks about in verse 1 that's coming over here in chapter 4 is a peace that guards our hearts, the heart being that our emotions, how we feel. What has guarded your heart this week? What has guarded your feelings this week? The heart, what has guarded your heart? Has it been your politics? Has it been your thoughts? Has it been your anger? Has it been your frustration? Or has it been the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is he the one who has guarded your heart? And when you're speaking, do you speak from a heart that is guarded from Christ? Or do we speak from a heart that's filled with anger, frustration, worry, fear, sadness, irritation, all those words that are there that need to be healed in our life, that need to be filled in. That's what healing is, you know. Healing is, healing is filling in the cracks, it's the brokenness, it's the filling in the cracks of all the, the brokenness that we have. It, it's not only our nation, it could be in your marriage, it could be in your workplace, because we're dealing with so many things. But this peace, he says, now this peace is going to heal our hearts. It's going to give us the heart healing that we need, because the heart is that emotional part of us. But now in this verse, he says, it's not only our hearts that are going to be healed, it's our minds that are going to be healed. It's our minds that are going to have the peace. What does that mean? It means what we think, right? That's what he's talking about. And sometimes we go to bed worried, we have less hope, we are fearful kind of people. And I'm not talking about the culture around us. I'm talking about the church, the ones where Paul has said, this great grace and peace is yours. How do we live that out? What does that change in our lives? I'm going to ask us to go on down to the latter part of this chapter, or in these verses. And I want you to look down with me at verse 9 and 10 and 11. Because in these verses, he helps us to understand that our identity now is really coming out of the obedience that is really unlocked for us for Christ. The obedience that we can have in verse, and we find those down there in verse 9, 10, and 11. He, he gets to that prayer idea again, right? He says, you're going to be praying. You're going to be praying about what God is doing in your midst. That prayer has to be central to who you are and what's happening inside that. And he tells us, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment. So he now says, it's my prayer that your love... Love for who? Love for Jesus. How much do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus more than anything? 
That's what Paul is trying to help us to understand our identity in. It's how we love Jesus. It's how the love is growing in our lives more and more and more and more and more. And with that love, he says, comes knowledge of knowing, not knowing stuff, not reading in order to know what's happening in the world, but a knowledge of who the Lord is. That's what he's talking about. The love that we have, the growing love for Christ, is going to allow us to have a greater knowledge of who he is, of what he's doing, and that leads us, he tells us in this verse, to be people who are discerning, people of wisdom. Why would we need wisdom? Well, he goes on to tell us that. In verse 10, he tells us why we need that love and discernment and wisdom. So that you may approve what is excellent and be pure and blameless. Pure and blameless for the day of Christ. You see, Christ is returning. We'll get to that in chapter 2 where every knee is going to bow. We believe that. So if we believe that, then our prayer and our growing love is going to move us to know more about Christ, is going to move us to, to love him more so that we have wisdom to live out our lives in such an excellent way that we are going to be pure and blameless. Now, it doesn't take rocket science for you to evaluate your life. It doesn't take rocket science or a lot of effort to think about the things I have said, I have written, I have responded to, I have reacted to, and ask the question, are those things pure? Are those things blameless? If Christ were to come now, would he find me as a saint set apart, loving him more? Would he find me to be pure and blameless? Would he find me to be a person who is praying for our nation, praying for healing, praying and confessing? Would he find me to be the person who is turning from my evil ways, from what I'm saying and what I'm responding? Would he find us as a church to be the kind of people who are living out our lives in the community around us so that the community around us sees us standing up, not for a political party or a person or anything like that, because we believe that the answer is not in political parties and people, but it's in Christ. That is the only answer. That is the only place we find hope. That is the only place that we're going to be able to live out our lives as the church. Why? Because we are about the kingdom of God, seeking first the kingdom of God. And then all these things are going to be added. He finishes with verse 11 where he says, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. The fruit of righteousness, not what we have accomplished, but what Christ has accomplished. Listen, I don't know what these next... 12 days are going to hold. I don't know what 2021 is going to hold. None of us do. We sure didn't think we'd be here a year ago, 10 months ago. But here we find ourselves. And their question is, how do you respond? As a follower of Christ, as a saint of God, one who Paul has said, we need to love Christ more and more. May your love abound more and more. And that's what I've been praying for us this week. I've been praying that as a church and as a people, that we can make an impact into the community around us. The nation, well, the nation we, we've got to pray for. The nations of the world who need Christ, we continue to pray for. But really for us, it's right here around us. It's the people that you interact with every day. At school this coming week, at work where you are, people around you that you influence, that have your sphere, those are the ones that need to see us as followers of Christ, being the people of God, being the people who say, Lord, heal us, heal our land, 
Heal our churches. Heal, heal our people. Heal our marriages. Heal our families. Heal the brokenness that only, only you can heal. Would you bow your heads and let's pray together? Would you take the time right now just to ask the Lord to, to do something significantly different than, than he's done in our lives? Maybe we, we see him in a new, fresh way. Maybe you recognize that there's something in, in your life that he wants to change. Boy, I've done that. What has to change in me? What has to change in you? That's the only way the church is going to change is if we as believers come to the place where it's gripping our lives with the passion that we are seeking the Lord above everything else because we are praying, we are humbling ourselves, we are seeking him earnestly, we are turning away from evil, we're abounding in love for the fruit of righteousness coming out of us. Lord, do that in our lives. Lord, we pray that you would do more in us than we could think or imagine, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. And we know that you love us. You died on the cross for our sin. You rose from the dead, not for us only, but for those around us. And Lord, you, you alone bring healing. You alone bring Give us the kind of peace that we need in our souls. You alone bring us the kind of, of heartfelt change that we have to have. You alone give us the hope that we have to have. Oh, Lord, bless us this day, not because we are good people. Bless us this day, not because we deserve it. Bless us this day because you are good. And you are love. And you are filled with compassion for us. And you want to heal our hearts, our souls, our nation, and the people of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand with me as we sing together?